there no, no problems. So here's the original economic agent uh, Adam Smith model. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about what uh, chemistry, physics, thermodynamics, and engineering has to say about this in the last 200 years since we've improved on this model. So the biggest common engineers came out of, there was 15 common engineers that came out of the, when the French Ecole Polytechnic School formed in 1795. There was 15, there was 15 engineers in the group that uh, took the principles they'd learned and they wanted to help, it, help France develop a better economy. And so they took the engineering, the mathematical and physics principles, and applied it to economics. And the biggest of the, all the economic engineers was Vilfredo Fredo here. He's a French-Italian uh, engineer, but then when he, and he studied mathematical physics, but then into his, uh, four, he, then he went in and worked his, for 10 years as a uh, railroad engineer supervisor. But then into his 40s, he started a whole new career. And he switched over into sociology and economics. And he went on to write nine volumes of socioeconomics socio based on physics, uh, chemistry, and engineering. Not in chemistry as much. But he, he went on to teach a, a, a course on political economy at the at Lucian, Lausanne University in Switzerland. And his theory, in 1897, he taught his students, theories of mathematical physics teach us how vibrations of material molecules the term of material molecules here is this conception of a person. So these are material molecules, consumers and producers, interfere and overlap. And this was based on the theory, the mathematical physics of the day that solid bodies were based, had molecules in structure and they vibrated. And science has advanced since in the last hundred years. We'll talk about what those improvements are. But he says perhaps one day we'll have similar theory of economic vibrations. The idea is that consumers and producers vibrate and there's exchange of goods. And he went on to work out how to calculate equilibrium. Now I'm a real, uh, when I do my, you can see my videos online, I'm a real hands-on person. I like to explain things with physical models. I have my social piston here. Uh, this, is, this is my social expansion and contraction. When you think of your, when you do formulation in socio, sociology and economics, you have to define your boundary. So the part right here is, could be the boundary of, of uh, Pichesti, the, the city boundary. And every day we have socio we have socioeconomic expansion, and there's also socioeconomic contraction due to the heating of the sun. I'll talk about this in a minute. And in my last like two months ago, I gave a lecture at Northern Illinois University to the mechanical engineering students and the, and the professors, where I explained to them how thermodynamics applies, where engineers can take thermodynamics and apply it in the humanities and social sciences. So just to do a quick. Uh, social experiments with here. If everybody could grab something, pencil, piece of paper, stand up, please, or if we could all stand up for one minute. This is, you got for, to this is for one one reason to make sure we're all awake. But, this, this, but the second reason is we're gonna, I'm gonna, when you do your modeling, you have to be able to explain things into this, both in terms of very simple, the fundamental definitions of science. So if everybody has to grab some paper or pencil or something around them, if you have one. Have one, 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 one. That's okay. As long as it, okay, now, what we're going to do is everybody can stay, take one step to the center. One step, please. Apropiați-vă de centru. Yes. Okay, that's first. That's the first part of the experiment. This is experiment part A. Now, experiment part B is everyone can take what they have and lift it in the air. Okay, that's experiment part B. So we can all sit down. We're all okay. awake and we've done some experiments. Now, the, the, there's some seriousness why a part that I do is based a little bit of humor, but the first part of the experiment, or the second part of the experiment, you lifted, you lifted a body to a vertical height. And this, what, what is done here is work. It's called the, August, the principle of the transmission of work. It's the definition of work. Force equals mass times distance. So when you move a, a body of mass through a unit distance, you've done work on the body. So the thing you've held, you've applied a force to the in my case, a laser pencil, and you've done work on the pencil. <clears throat> now, work is the fundamental definition of, of the economic system. So to use, we'll look at in slide, uh, slide, when we get to slide 17, I'll go through these slides pretty fast. American uh, chemist, mathematician, and statistical mechanicist, uh, Elliot Montrall, he defined the economic system as, as no, that's okay, I'm gonna go back. Elliot Montrell, he defined the economic system. He applied, 
He's the one that uh, originated the spin concept, the idea that people are like ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic bodies. Perhaps any anyone who's studied quantum physics, they've heard of Eugene Stanley. And he's uh, he uses the spin model to model. You can you can model people as particles, and you can say a political influence like the uh, dictatorship in North Korea aligns everybody's viewpoint. But anyways, Elliot, Mon Elliot Montrell says you can define an economic system as either composed of individuals or families. And within the family, you have to have somebody that's doing work. One of the members of the family has to have a job. Not all the members, but, but that structure defines the economic system. So in our experiment just now, we have a basic model of, dip of work. It's called the dip principle of transmission of work by French. This is Gustave Coriolis, Cor the same person as behind the Coriolis Cor Cor principle. The way that water spins differently on the north and south sides of the hole. But in the first experiment, we've done work on the object. The second, first, or in the second, the first part of the experiment, uh, in a sense, I've done the forces of our system here have done work causing you to move. And there's a difference between the two points of view, which you have to take into account and do your your application of chemistry and physics to the humanities. So here's a little bit about myself. Since 1995, I've been working on, this is a social mechanism here. A plus B are a person modeled as, you can either think of a person as human chemical, whereas radio thought of people as material molecules. We now think of people either as human chemicals or human molecules. This is the symbol, I know it, everybody thinks I'm from Hungary, Hungary. <laughs> but uh, this is the symbol for human element. This comes from Dow Chemical, right? the big advertisement campaign they had in 2008. So where the number here is 70 to the 0 0.09 is human population. So you can think of uh, the population of the planet as a system of reactive molecules. And this is the representative symbol of my philosophy. So I've been working on this, how you apply, you can break everything down in society. This is a simple combination reaction. A man and a woman combined into a relationship. And how do you apply thermodynamics to this? So right now, the work I've done, written a total of about 10 volumes since, 19, since 2000. The biggest, if you, in, a, in your handout there, you have the, uh, or let's see, these handouts here. Okay, if we can just pass these around. This one here is the top 38 humanity scholars in 2007, based on, and this is, one over here is top humanity scholars based on number of humanity scholars that have their book. Humanities, physical science is the journal is the main vehicle of transmission of information. But in humanities, the book is the main vehicle of transmission of knowledge. So this, the list over here is the, the list of the top uh, 38 humanity scholars based on Scholars who've had their books cited more than 500 times in, one, in, in 2007. And the other handout is the, the top uh, scientists who have blended either are the core, the, car, the core scientists that you want to pull your theory from. In the last, uh, so last, since 2008, I've written 3,000 online articles. And this is called Equal Media. This is everything that's ever been written on chemistry, physics, thermodynamics and engineering applied into the humanities. So if you look at, the, you just want to take that copy with you because the, the URL there is uht.info. And everything I'm talking about in the lecture, you can go on this site and find everything online. So I'm also the author of the journal of the thermodynamics, we'll be coming up on our 10th anniversary here in 2015. In fact, I own, and Georgie has recently done some review for us. And if anyone in the room wants to publish anything on thermodynamics, or chemistry and physics and thermodynamics, you have some article, you can send it to me and I'll get it reviewed and there's a good chance I'll publish it. I've written these two books in 2007. This book here, Human Molecule, this, there's, there's been, this is the, instead of thinking about Bill Fred, Bill Fred, Bill Fred thought about people as material molecules. Now we think that we know that the composition in Prado's day, the, uh, 
Mendeleev had only recently formulated the periodic table, only 20 years before Pareto, the Italian engineer, thought of people's material molecules. This is the Mendeleev periodic table. There's 70 elements and some are missing. Now we know all the elements of the periodic table, and we know that humans are comprised of 26 atoms. And when you take a mass composition of a human, you can formulate what's called the molecular formula of a human. And this is the 26 element molecular formula. So I wrote a history book on all of this. In uh, 2000, this is my first textbook here. This is basically, if you take all of society and break it down into mechanisms, what would happen if you wrote a textbook on that? And this is what the result. The second book here is a history of the concept of the human molecule. And this was interesting, was, not, was profiled by the, this one was nominated for a Nobel Prize. This, this one, more interestingly, was profiled the IG Nobel Prize, that's the group that makes you laugh and then makes you think. So a lot of people, when they see what I'm talking about, first they laugh, they say, oh, this guy is crazy. But IG Nobel Prize did a four article profile on this book and, and uh, the YouTube videos I have on this, which is pretty cool. So, one thing you have to, some people look at this here and they say this is uh, pointless, this doesn't tell us anything. We know that when a man meets a woman, 95 people are going to fall in love, they're going to form a relationship. But if you put it in terms of a formula like this, it says that this tells us absolutely nothing, nothing new. So here's one person, Ryan Granley, Irish biochemistry student. He spent a month blogging about me, writing a series of articles on how he says, he says this is all a horrendous analogy. When you apply physics and chemistry to people, it, it, there's, there's, two, there's two natures. There's human nature and then there's chemical nature, and the two cannot mix. So he says this whole thing is horrendous analogy. He says uh, human behavior is too complex to be, it, of course we were, we're governed by chemical laws. He says human behavior is too complex to be described by a couple of thermodynamic equations. But then on this mechanism right here, which is called a Kuklin reaction or a combination reaction, he said it's pretentious, which means I'm just being showy. And he says it's stating something we already know and it tells us absolutely nothing new. So when you look at your, your existence from the side or going forward, it's difficult to see mechanisms. But when you sit down, this book here is the best book on uh, mechanisms in terms of looking back. The American sociologist Diane Vaughn interviewed 100 people and on turning points in their uh, intimate relationships, whether it was with a job, or with a person, family, or your uh, social political belief. And the mechanisms like this don't happen uh, in this one day. So if you read through her book, just as we all can think back to the, the uncoupling process, the reverse of this is called uncoupling, where you come undone. And it's a approximately a three-year process for normal uncoupling. So when you sit back and look back at your experiences, your, uh, your reaction existence experiences, you can think back to points when you, you say, oh, I, I, this is when I realized I was going to break away from this uh, person, this job, this uh, belief system, or this way of, of living. And then you can think back when there was actually one day where there was a certain uh, turning point, like a tipping point. And so the mechanism was actually very complicated. Now, this right here, is, this is where the cutting edge of the work is. <laughs> right now, I answer, we're, we're all talking about how we want to look to the uh, chemistry and physics for modeling. And uh, Da Vinci said, that no real science or no exact science can be called science unless you can model it mathematically. So what we're going to talk about today is how, how do you go about modeling socioeconomics systems mathematically? And this is, the, this is where the, the future will be. Uh, Russian mathematician Vladimir Arnold says, uh, thermodynamics is based on a very complicated branch of mathematics called contact geometry. According to Gibbs, the geometrical structure of thermodynamics is described by a contact manifold equipped with a contact form whose zeros define the laws of thermodynamics, where epsilon is energy, T is temperature, eta is entropy, P is pressure, V is volume. Gibbs is the main person you're going to want to go to here to get your theories from, and the Greek Gibbs is very difficult to read because, as you see here, he writes in Greek and also in English. So he says, if we call this contact five manifold, the Gibbs manifold, the Gibbs thesis is this, substances are the generated sub-manifolds on the Gibbs manifold. Yeah, so in speaking in simple terms, the socioeconomic system is called what is called a heterogeneous substance. And people inside of the system are called chemical substances. 
And if you map this, you get these three-dimensional plots. You can plot the energy, the volume, and the entropy of the socioeconomic system and get these thermodynamic Cartesian plots. When you do it in socioeconomic terms to correct, clarify things, you cannot plot en energy, but you plot enthalpy because socioeconomic systems are, this is for an isobaric, isophoric system, which means that you have constant pressure, atmospheric pressure, but you also have constant volume, which means your social boundary doesn't change. So just to give an example here, when a year ago when Russia invaded Georgia, there was an expansion outward of the socioeconomic boundary of Russia into Georgia. So that's what's called an iso, you have, then you have isothermal process, isothermal, isobaric, which means constant temperature, constant pressure, and then you would be plotting what's called the enthalpy which is a function that skips the energy. So the long and the short of the story here is, uh, George was talking about you want to be able to predict. You want to make an economic model that predicts if you're, you're, you want to run a society based on real world models. Any kind of prediction you want to do in sociology and economics, you're going to have to turn to what's called the negative of the change in the Gibbs free energy, because the free energy is what physical chemists use to predict small scale reactions that are occurring in a, in a battery, in a surface, in a test tube. So if the predictions can work here, it's just a matter of scaling this up to whatever however you want to predict your relationships. So to keep moving here, the, here's Newtonian geometry. So Newtonian geometry is real simple. It's for projectile geometry. So you throw up a, a football and it travels through a curved arc. And if you calculate the change in the distance with respect to time, you can get calculate the first derivative gives you the velocity. Second derivative gives you the acceleration. So when your slope reaches zero here, continue, continuing to zero, the slope implies the object is at rest. This is equivalent in your in economic equilibrium. The economy is stalled out and there's no more movement. So in the same way, when you carry this over to Gibbsian geometry, this is what you're going to get for your socioeconomic. Uh, when you say you want to, when Da Vinci says no real science, is real science unless you can explain it mathematically. So this is where you're going to get your real science explanations from. Most of this is, on the surface it looks fairly complicated. There's only two or three different, uh, so here we have just two variable systems. But in Gibbs geometry we have a five contact geometry system, which means that we're modeling the volume change, the enthalpy change, which is kind of the energy of the system, and that correlates to bonds, social economic bonds, plus your kinetic energy or your, your pressure volume and your energy, and then you have what's called your transformation content energy, which is everyone else's entropy, and most people know that. So in the same way, you can calculate the derivative, calculate the economic equilibrium that's equivalent to when the slope reaches zero. In Gibbsian geometry terms, you're gonna get these same graphs, but they're just going to be, let's take that, they're gonna look like this. So Gibbs made the first uh, thermodynamic geometry graphs. And this AB right here is your free energy. This is available energy. This is what, you, if you can measure this AB system in your socio, this, this slope right here, in your socioeconomic system, you can predict whether your economic model will progress. This is your capacity for entropy. Now, this is very complicated material. Gibbs, uh, Willard Gibbs, everyone does know, he's America's first uh, PhD engineer. And he's the founder of chemical thermodynamics. When he first wrote his work, he sent it out to 200 of the leading scientists. And there's only one person that was able to understand his work, and that was James Clerk Maxwell. He's the first behind the theory of the electromagnetic field, that, that where the, the, everything around us, the force, the force that uh, when we did our social experiment just now, you lifted the pencil, you moved the pencil, and I moved you in the first part. The force in each of those cases is the electromagnetic force, and the person behind that is James Maxwell. And to get to our graphs here, Gibbs sent this, sent his work out to Maxwell. And Maxwell spent the next the entire winter constructing a three-dimensional graph because kids only made things to two dimensions. So what Maxwell did is he take this, he used, went out in sunlight, and he took this plot and this plot, and he used the sunlight to make these, these, these con iso contours of constant volume and constant temperature, and he used the sunlight to carve the slopes in there. So first he made a graph. If you flip this around on the backside here, upside down, and you flip this around underneath, you get, first you can draw things out, then you can make a plaster mold plus of this. And he sent this to Gibbs as a gift in 1775. So this is, and just to give you a simple, simple example, here's over 700 equations underlying all this. It's, 
this is where the future holds, the future lies with. Over here is one example by Adrian, physical chemist Adrian Delange. You can find that on the online site. He took, this is a mixture of what Gibbs did here. You see the word term free energy. This is a mixture of uh, uh, swing to chaos, Prigozhin bifurcation theory, which is uh, what I understand you, you did your dissertation on Prigozhin. So he mixes Gibbs chemical thermodynamics here, Prigozhin far from equilibrium thermodynamics, plus this is evolution, Darwinian evolution, which is uh, the idea that there is uh, survival of the fittest. So this is survival of the fittest mixed, mixed with all of this, and you get this three-dimensional graph here. That's just one example that shows you that you can't take these concepts and apply them to socioeconomics. And here's your socioeconomic system here. Now, this is what's called freud schiller drive theory. To give you another example, the AB part on the graph that I showed here, this AB right here, Freud read about this. This is another example where you can, you don't even have to use equations. I'm, I'm gonna show you a lot of equations today, but Freud took, just took the verbal concepts of free energy, and this is bound energy. If you multiply the entropy times the temperature of the system, you get what's called bound energy. So what Freud did was he took, he read Hamilton in 1882 to find free energy, as he says, given the unlimited validity of Clausius' second law, it's the change in the free energy, not the total energy resulting from heat production within any system which determines in which sense the infinities can be accurate. Now the infinity here is this is the infinity. This is the, the force, the chemical for electromagnetic force that caused these two human molecules to bind into the, the dot, what's called the dihumanite molecule. Those two molecules bond into one structure. And there's, there's chemical energy stored in this bond. But what Hamilton proved was that it's the, the change in your socioeconomic system is measured by free energy. Whereas this is the macro quantitative measure of your socioeconomic system. The affinity is the micro aspect. Why does the individual pers person uh, have a desire to purchase a, a good? And so Hamilton's, Freud took all the, Freud was, Freud's medical school advisor was Ernest von Bruck, a German physiologist. And Ernest von Bruck was the medical school buddy of Hemmels. So Freud learned this bound energy and free energy concept. And he wrote 24 volumes of psychology. You find psychology, you know it now. And he, it's, everyone who raised Freud is, it's very dense reading, but it all comes from this. Freud specifically claimed, combined this is your free energy. What Hemmels showed mathematically is that the derivative of the free energy of your system, in order for the socioeconomic system to progress, the derivative of the free energy change with respect to time has to be less than zero. So Freud took this concept and applied it to psychology, but he also took Frederick Schiller, which was a German poly into like Goethe's bite, and Schiller wrote this poem in 1795. He says, just as the water drives the mill, so too does in the, the world holds its transmission by hunger and love. And this has been recondensed into the idea that the world is ruled by hunger and love. So Freud combined this plus the free energy and went on to find psychology. And Carnot, who formulated thermodynamics, which is what the main core you're going to want to, the tool you're going to want to use to construct any type of chemical physical models of economies, Sadi Carnot from the French engineering school, the Tully Polytechnic, he had the idea that there was, when he came in the 1820s, there was a number of different heat engines, all kinds of different geometries. And he, he understood there was an underlying principle to this. So just, just as there, any kind of heat engine that works by expansion and contraction, whether you take an iron bar and you heat it and it expands, you take steam, you heat it and you contract it, or you take a socioeconomic system and you heat it and you contract it, from those principles, all of those are heat engines. You can construct the principles of the transmission of work. So he envisioned the idea that just as in the fall of the water from high to low, there's the fall of what's called chloric, so precursor to heat, quantities of heat. Right here. This is in the fall of chloric, so too does the fall of chloric drive the steam engine. So in socioeconomic terms, through what's called the five contact geometry, the free energy is what drives the socioeconomic system, the decrease in free energy. So 
So now we're at, we're going to talk about quantum physics because I know that this is the big, right now in the world, the quantum physics is the main uh, vehicle people are talking about in terms of applying physics to economics because economics is real popular. And a lot of the models, though, that we have in quantum physics are real simple models. This is the, this is your sociologist here who's frustrated or your, your humanity scholar who's trying to figure out something in economics or sociology. And this is the physicist in the cartoon. Because it says, oh, this is very simple. Just to predict your, your complicated system, just model it as a simple object and then account for secondary terms by the complications I just thought of. So they, a lot of physicists, if they're trained in whatever field, nuclear physics or a ferromagnetic physics, they'll, they'll jump into economic modeling with these real simple models. So here's an example here, James. The cartoon here is actually found online in the 2000 article by American financial mathematician Aaron Brown. This article is titled The Most Arrogant Book in the World, which he says this book is. So we, what we want to do here is explain to you how you, you want to school yourself a little bit before you end up writing arrogant books, which we're going to do. And another thing you want to get away from is what's called toolism. This was just published two months ago by I think he's German, but his, his uh, Igmont Kara, it's a very interesting article. He says, there's so much of just pick, cherry picking equations right now in quantum physics that a quantum physicist, here's Arnold Schwarzenegger, he says it's comparable to Arnold going in a gun shop and picking out a powerful gun and then writing some article. And these are going to be published almost by the monthly rate. So here's your equations and your principles are considered powerful weapons. And to give an example of the silliness of this, he uses Jean French, this is Jean Philip uh, Beauchard. Beauchard says uh, that the, the Curie Wise Mean Field approximation is going to have, we'll find it's a very powerful tool and we'll find many natural applications in economics and social sciences. Well, this may or, not, may be, may or may not be true. Uh, this is an equation that governs ferromagnetic bodies. This, some of this is very, uh, society is not a ferromagnetic body. Society is a system of chemically reactive molecules moving on the surface, contained within semi-permeable semi boundaries. And what I mean by semi-permeable is there's migration in and out of countries. Or like me, I came from America today, through a, I had to pay to come fly here, and there was a took amount, a certain amount of work to go through that, and quantify that work thermodynamically, in terms of specifically, in terms of me coming here, you want to use what's called the uh, uh, membrane in cellular thermodynamics, there's a certain model for how a particle goes across the boundary in a cell. And you, that, that's a model you want to use to talk about boundary changes. But the way you want to, what you want to do to get away from toolism here is the online encyclopedia where I wrote 3,000 articles. These are the big social newtons. They're all ranked, rank order of radius. So Goethe is the heart, is the, is, he's the one who founded social mechanism. Someone who's actually been called a social newton is Henry Carey. He wrote a social mechanics Three volume social uh, sociology book in 1858, and all these are ranked. And then Henry Adams here, he's the second most powerful. He spent 50 years applying chemistry, physics, thermodynamics, and also engineering principles to understand history. And he actually wrote out all these, a number of different. Uh, in 1910, he wrote a book called uh, Letter to American Teachers of History, where he advocated, he was, he was a leading historian at Harvard, he advocated the teaching of thermodynamics to understand history, big history. And one of the things why he's so powerful is he, to amuse himself, he wrote a nine volume set of history just to prove to himself that history happens mechanistically. So to get away from toolism, you want to school yourself in these grades here. And these are some of the modern grades here. Jordan Hippies is social newton number two. Thomas Wallace, he models social, socioeconomic systems thermodynamically. Thomas Wallace does the same thing. He's a physical chemist, though, and he models the rise and fall of civilizations in terms of thermodynamics. So you're going to want to study these works if you want to get away from toolism. So the focus of today's lecture is we're going to want to talk about what is a person. So in the old days, when you get into, this was all about in the abortion days. Like what, how do you, when is a person to become a person? Uh, two people have sex, the sperm, gets within, let's say, three micrometers from the egg, is the person, the person then. What about when the, when the sperm makes contact with the, with the egg? Is the, per, is, the, is the person then, a living person, technically? 
what about when you get to the blastula stage when a when a sperm and egg forms a 20 to 60 uh, cellular blob? Is the person then? So these are these are what are called thorny moral questions, and whether you whether it's legal or not for a person to have an abortion. So there's a spectrum of when you can say a person is a person and a, and a liar and those kind of questions. And then in the 1980s. Modern medicine advanced enough so that you can keep people alive. Say a person was completely brain dead, you can keep his body alive. Is the person still a person then? Or conversely, the Russians did experiments in the uh, 40s where they cut dogs' heads off. And you can take, you can watch these on YouTube. They pump blood through the dog's head, and you can a dog whose head will be seen on a counter. They pump its blood through it, and you can take a hammer and make noise, and the dog reacts. You can say, well, it is. You can do that likewise with the same thing with a person, but. When a person is, is a person like that being kept alive by artificial means, like a person with Alzheimer's or something like that. So now we're talking about social physics and social economics. And this book right here is resulted because when you start applying chemistry and physics and thermodynamics to economics, you start to grapple with more thorny issues than what defines a person. Is a person a particle, an atom, or a molecule? So in the sheet, they handed you but the humanity sheet, the top 37 ranked humanities in 2007. Number two is Pierre Bordeaux, he's second ranked. It's most cited, second most cited humanity scholar in the world right now. And he uses Newtonian mechanics to conceive of socioeconomic systems, he uses the term fields, power, latent, which means stored energy potential. And he thinks of people as a particle, which will be acted on by social, by the field. And it's, there's also a battlefield. So when you get into social physics, you're going to get into questions of what is a person. So here's a quick timeline. This slide's real popular with people who I did some market research before I came here. The old model here is the Egyptian model. First, people were, this is the equivalent of Adam and Eve, performed on a clay potter's wheel. This was the god Isis, the precursor to the Virgin Mary. This is the god Kenum. And Kenum forms the clay figures on the surface, and it gives them shape. And the part the spirit into them, the goddess Isis puts the ankh, which is called the symbol of life, puts it to the nose of the clay figures, and that gives it the principle of animation. And also in this model is the principle of morality, which is called the, the ba, which is the soul. So right now at this stage, 2600, and the person, the main person responsible for this is Egyptian poly math Imhotep. He's the person behind the first pyramid. And the pyramids are all symbolic of all this. The birth of the sun out of the pyramid represents the birth of life. In the idea that the Egyptians, back in the flat earth period days, the sun was born each day and then died each night. And some, some people will, will object to this, say, well, why am I talking this right now? Just by a show of hands, how many people right now believe they are alive? You'll, you'll all laugh at me. When I get to this, you'll think maybe I'm in a straitjacket. But when you, sit, when you start applying, I'll show you actually quotes. But you we've all laugh right now, but we'll show you some quotes in a minute here. Uh, the person who discovered DNA, Francis Crick, in 1968, he wrote a book called Molecules of Loose Men. In the book, when you actually sit down and try to figure out what exactly life is, especially, particularly at the origin of life level, he concludes that we must abandon the word alive. And you can also find uh, Nikola Tesla, famous Serbian electrical engineer, who concluded in 1915 that there is no thing endowed with life. So just as everybody has raised their hand if they're alive, Tesla says there's no thing endowed with life. And both Tesla and uh, Crick are correct. But to move forward here, Descartes says, the next model is Descartes. Descartes stripped away the spirit part, but he kept the person his mouth out of as an automaton, chemical operated by gears and pulleys. And he says the spirit, this is a two nature model. There's, the spirit is found in the amygdala. And so, while most of the body is operated by mechanical laws, there's also a moral part that's kept in the amygdala, where the soul is. That's the trans transformation of this ba into this model. Now, the next model is the Bossier. He started doing some experiments where he conceived of combustion reactions happening in the lung. It's called the amplitude. So we're mechanical, biochemical. Now we're at John von Neumann. He's one of the early inventors of the computer. And he conceived the idea, he took the Cartes automaton theory here, but he can see the idea of self-organization out of the time period and mixed in with chemical theory. He thought, he conceived the idea 
that you can take a number of electrical parts, batteries and wires, and let them float on a lake. And the definition of life is when those parts self-organize into an automaton, it reproduces automaton. So here's Watson and Crick. Watts, Crick was the one that says that, he says we must abandon the word alive, and I'll try to explain that, why you can replace the word alive with either animate or reactivity and still have a conceptual understanding of why you move around. So Watson and Crick discovered DNA. So now a lot of us have the belief in us that the, the purpose of existence is to pass along DNA. I'm, I'm sure, I'm not gonna fool everybody, I'm sure that seven, three out of four people have some kind of conception of that in their mind. So now this is the modern view of what we're gonna to wanna to talk about here. If you look at the handout I gave you, first on your list, about from the, uh, not the humanities ranking list, but the HMOpedia ranking list. First on the line, the ranking is Gibbs. Gibbs is the person behind all these equations. Gibbs trained Gilbert Lewis. He went to MIT, and then he went to, he founded the University of California Berkeley Chemical Thermodynamics Department, right now the world's leading chemical engineering department. Lewis, who's all, they're all on the list I gave you, Lewis in turn, this was his PhD student. He wrote, he wrote the second thermodynamics textbook after Lewis in 18, 1950 called Chemical Thermodynamics. So in 1971, he won the Priestley Medal and he gave a lecture called Chemical Thermodynamics in the Real World. So if you want to model social, sociology or economics in terms of real world models, you're gonna to have to use chemical thermodynamics. The short, long and short of Rossini's lecture is that entropy defines the freedom of society and enthalpy defines security. And we'll talk about his models in a second here, but the simple example is, that there's a big debate in this in America right now, ever since 9-11, People in America want to be free, but ever since the 9-11 attack, people also want security. So we have more airport security, there's more, there's cameras all over the place in America, people are watching our internet activity, so there's a compromise between wanting to be freedom and security. So just an example Rosini gave here to, to prove this, is to give an example of hydrogen reacting through equilibrium reaction to form separate hydrogen atoms. This is hydrogen molecule. And the double bond here is what's called Lewis dot structure. And you've got to understand that there is what's called bond energy stored in this bond. That's bond energy comes from Chris Haber. He's one of the first, uh, one of the biggest thermodynamics of the early 20th century. So just as in the model I showed you before of the, the man and the woman reacting from the bond, just as there's bond energy stored in the dihydrogen molecule, there's also bond energy stored in relationships we have with other people. We have to account for that in terms of this enthalpy quantity here. It's very, very dense quantity. It's a measure of the bond energy, the energy of the system, plus the pressure volume work energy. Like I showed you here, when uh, Russia invaded Georgia, there was an expansion into Georgia. That's an example of pressure volume work energy that's quantified here in terms of this. Russia, Russia invaded uh, Georgia likely because they were concerned about their security. I don't know all the details, but you can loosely see them, the idea here. So this is what, this is a quantity of the recent uh, social physics, socioeconomics articles where people are debating. Uh, Katrina Sisnar here, she says, she gave a PowerPoint presentation in Poland just two years ago, where at one point she says, can we treat people like particles? And Dietrich Stouffer here, he got into chemical physics after reading her work. He's, he's got an article in 2011, he says, humans are neither spins nor atoms. This is the, what's, he's making a parody here. He's getting sick of seeing these ferromagnetic articles where people are modeled as ferromagnetic bodies. And Steve Bowler here, he objects to the whole thing on religious grounds. He says, I'm not, he especially objects to Philip Ball. He's, he wrote Critical Mass. Everyone, most, if anyone, if you haven't read this, read Critical Mass, I was just reading this after this, if you want to learn more about what I'm talking about here. But Steve Bowler objects on religious grounds because it, if you reduce to a certain level, you lose the spiritual and moral part, and you treat a person as a molecule. And Gus, this is the old school way of looking at things here. Ludwig Buchner says, just as man and woman attract one another, so too does oxygen and hydrogen attract each other. Well, that's a correct statement. The incorrect statement here is he's using the term loving and life. Those are metaphysical terms. So when you do your socioeconomic theorizing, you want to get away from metaphysical terms, and instead you want to use technical terms that are actually actually have foundation and so you can use reactivity or animation for life and loving is the replacement for those terms happen more effectively. So for example, 
Right now I'm the senior editor of Journal of Human Thermodynamics. When anybody sends me an article with the word life in it, I have to completely rewrite the whole article and replace it with either animated or reactivity because thermodynamics doesn't recognize metaphysical terms. So here's the, this is what's called the start classification. This is going to give you a spectrum of, of what's called normative social mechanism theorists all the way down in descending order to extreme social mechanism theorists. <coughs> this is by a Czechos uh, Hungarian born English sociologist, here at Hungarian Czechoslovakia, where I start. But he went over to England and he was one of the leading sociologists. He wrote to advise the soul classification scheme. Now, just as you all laughed when I asked if you were alive, so too did Stark laugh. And he specifically classified Henry Carey's most extreme social mechanism. When I say social mechanism, Goethe was the one inventing social mechanism. This is what's called the bonding bracket. And if you have a bond to someone, a marriage bond, in this case, he's in a, he's in a relationship living on a vast estate in his book, 1809, Lack of Affinities. He's married to Charlotte, but the, mar but the marriage is teetering on breakup. And so a new reactant comes into the state, the state is semi-fragile, or boundary, and then he writes 36 chapters of the different reactions that happen in each chapter as a controlled experiment. And uh, the, the third, the act, this mechanism comes from William Cullen, who says, this is the, where chemical reaction models come from. He says, he explained this in a lecture, just like I'm doing now. He says, the dart represents the electric attraction, the other one, the force to reaction. He says that when I put the tail of one substance, pointing to another substance, it says the electric force it unites more strongly to this one than it does this one. And if these three things are put into, into contact together, this one will be forced to go to this one and detach from this one out of its bond. And so what Goethe did, I suppose it maybe will be helpful to show this like we did yesterday. It helps seem to help. We, we all went out to the restaurant on the lake yesterday. What's that called? Zahana. Yeah. Zahana. We all went to Zahana yesterday. So this is the uh, these are what these are what Goethe calls the Goethe right here is he's the German Shakespeare. A lot of people think of him as a poet philosopher, but he he studied chemistry for fifty years. And what Newton did, this right here, this is called the Jeffreys, these are all called affinity tables. This is the first one. Jeffrey, Etienne Jeffrey was a French chemist. And in First Newton wrote his Principia, if I'm pronouncing that right, and then he, then he became famous, then he wrote, went around and wrote his optics books, and he became more famous. And then at the end of his optics, when he was near the end of his publishing career, he wrote a series of unsolved philosophical puzzles called queries. And the last of these puzzles was called Query 31, where it was the chemical phenomenon. And what he did was he listed chemical reactions in descending order. So say if I have hydrogen and oxygen in a bonding reaction, but then I added sulfuric acid, Sulfuric acid will displace the hydrogen and, and the oxygen will walk its own. You rank five reactions in verbal form and paragraph. So in 1718, French chemist Etienne Geoffroy took this verbal paragraph and he made this affinity table. So at the top of the reaction, say you list all, all the people in a given socioeconomic system. This one has 16 people in it. And you rank, not everyone can react to everybody else. So, for example, say you're at a party and you know somebody you don't like is coming to the party, you will leave before you, the person gets there if you really don't like the person. So this is what's called a single displacement reaction. So just as not everybody in society can react with everybody else, Ethan and Jeffrey rank all chemicals like this. So this is ranked in terms of, these are the least reactive chemicals here, it's ranked in terms of affinity power. So for example, if this top chemical species is in a relationship with this weaker species here, in this case it's uh, hydrogen chloride, and the bottom here we have Silver. So hydrogen chloride is in a bond with silver. But then I introduce any one of these other species into the mixture. In this case, uh, hydrogen, uh, let's see. If I ask, introduce tin into the mixture, the tin will, the hydrogen chloride will break off with the, the, the aluminum and bond with tin. And this is, these are all, this, each one of these steps is, they're all ranked in preferences like this. So these affinity tables got bigger and bigger over the, the 18th century, this is the biggest one. It's called Bergman's Affinity Table. And what Goethe did, right here, he took this affinity table, and all these are different chemical reaction mechanisms, just like A plus B. He took, this is what they look like in modern terms, but in this day they look like this. And he wrote 36 chapters for each chapter is social mechanism. 
based on all these 82, these 64 reactions, and you base model society based on these mechanism reactions. And so this is where social mechanisms come from, and all these are the ranking according to start of social mechanism theories. So for example, George Lundberg, here is an American sociologist, or he might be a English, I can't remember. But he modeled people as proton electron configurations. So the farther you go down is here's Bill Flutter and Peter right here, the person we're talking about, the kind of engineer, he's in the middle, in between the normative and extreme. George Lundberg says that people are proton electron configurations. So we all know, we all know from chemistry that we're made of protons and we are made of electrons. So there's and we're also made of neutrons, so there's a truth away saying there. But uh, the farther you go down this descent down from metaphor to reality, the more you're going to say, people are going to say that you're a lunatic. So, for example, when Stark does his classification, he says this paragraph written by Henry Carey, in an inorganic world, every act of combination is an act of motion. So it is in the social world or the organic world. If it is true that there is but one system of laws for the government of all, of all matter, we here, government of all economic systems, then those which govern the movement of various inorganic bodies should be the same as those which are regulated by the motion of society. And such is the case can be readily shown. So this is extreme mechanism according to Stark. And he says when Harry comes to this paragraph, he puts on it, he puts on an example here. Here we see Harry back in his straitjacket. So if you believe, if you write any kind of theory where there's only one nature, which is what Goethe did here. And then people, you're going to have conflict with the social belief system. And that's going to be, that happens in America, it happens with me almost monthly. And so if you're going to theorize about social heat here, for example, here's another one of Carrie's, Carrie, Werner Stark says this about this, this fundamental form of social heat. If you believe, you come to believe that the way in which a match is strikes, uh, if I take a match and I strike the thing and the match lights, and if you believe, that the way I struck the principles that govern the striking of the match are the same as those when Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated, that it, it, it struck off uh, World War I, won the World War II, and 20 million, 20 million people died. If you believe that, that those two processes are the same, the, the match, the spark of that killing versus the spark of the activation of the match, if you believe those are that's governed by the same principles, people are going to say that you're losing it. But nevertheless, it's just a matter of thesis and conflict. So here's the first, the, here's the original, and now we're going to go through the new models real fast. The uh, original model is the clay model we talked about. So here's the first school of social physics in America. And this was run by John P. Stewart. He's the, we were talking about last night, he wrote a book called, uh, uh, what did you say was the, ge, ge, what book do you want to write? The ge, geographical? Yeah, he wrote a couple called Geographical Physics. And he wrote, he wrote, he went to old school with Percy Bridgman, who was one of the biggest thermodynamicists of the 20th century. He's known for his Bridgman equations, and two sociologists. And in this group, Stuart Dobbs was, was, was the religious one. So you're always, it doesn't really matter, even if you form your social, your kind of physics school here in Manchester, you're always going to have a plan where more don't, or don't mix their religion into their modeling. You always have some that want, that want to mix their religion into their. So when Stuart Dodd did his equations, he when he was, he concluded at the end of his uh, bio, biographical biography that he was he believed the equations were the work of God, something along those lines. So this stuff is going to be modern. And where does the belief system come from? By just you, just like America is mostly Christian, about eighty percent, and uh, India is mostly Hindu, and the Muslim countries are mostly Islam religions. What most people don't know. Is all of these have the parent religions, Abrahamic theologies and Rahamic theologies have the parent religion, the father of all born of none. Ra is the literal translation of the son. Born, he died, they the died, the Egyptian theological model. Ab or B is the Hebrew translation of father. Ham here means Kem. We were talking about that lecture. Kem is the when the Nile floods every day, yearly, there's a 120 day flood. And then when the flood recedes, it leaves this black, fertile soil called Kim. And that's the root word of chemistry, and all the world's modern religions have the same root word. So Father Ra, born of none, run sun rises, the land recedes, and the land, the none is called the land now. We all, we all know this story as Noah's Ark. The land rises out of the flood, 
and the uh, flood receives it 100 days, and life first forth. All humans are descended from this raw model. So whenever you talk about love, life, and the morality system, you're always going to have conflict, because the roots of your conflict come from this belief system. 75% of the world has belief system. This is not exactly aligned. Well, the, theory, the theory can be corrected, but it's not exactly aligned with how chemistry and physics these things. So here's, yes, here's the distribution of the world religions here. So America is mostly this, so is Romania. Goethe says, the person who advised the social mechanism, he says, if you're, you remain ignorant, if you don't know what, what's going on in the last 3,000 years, you remain ignorant. The same thing is my belief system, but now it's, if you don't know what's going on in the last 13.7 billion years, Harley, uh, Harold Schaefer, American astronomer, first predicted the size of the universe, I think. He says, if some people say in the beginning God, but he says in the beginning hydrogen. Well, this is my belief system. I say in the beginning hydrogen. So here's the models. This, the second model is the Pedocles. He had the four forces. And this is, he's the first, he's the original. When Goethe wrote his Elected Infinities book, he quotes from Pedocles. Everyone has maybe a certain phrase, people like each other mix like water and wine. People hate each other separate like oil and water. He based that on what's called five, four element, two forces theory. And this is one nature theory. There's no uh, uh, spirituality or soul and moral elements in there. But when it gets to the atomic theory school of the atomic, Atomic theorists, Lucidus, Alcritus, and Epicurus, people have free will because of them. everything in the universe is atoms, vacuum, and movement. But for humans, uh, there's a swerve of the atom that gives humans free will as salvages religion. So this is two, this is dualism. And this guy, Leonardo da Vinci, he has a geometric model that's based on his ideas about the structure of the universe. But the cards here we have the dualism again. The cards says a person is an automaton. That the soul is bound in the pineal plane. So go, go, Goethe's view was that instead of this soul found in the pineal plan, the new system for the new golden rule of ethics is a principle found in the moral symbols of physical chemistry. And these, these are the moral symbols that Goethe's referring about here. Goethe specifically says that he read this book, which was published in German in 1885, and he says we can construct, we can find new moral symbols in this system here. So instead of turning to the old, the old days to the Bible, the crayon of the Great Vita, or the IT chain to construct your economic system. Because right, for example, right now, uh, most of the Islam countries, a lot of their government is based on what the crayon says. So if you want to write the new economic system, the new morality system, you have to turn to these physical symbols. And so the way these symbols get translated, now we understand these symbols in terms of physical chemistry and chemical thermodynamics. So this symbol I have in my shirt here, this is the first to coin the term new molecule. He says we can conclude, this is French philosopher Jean Sales, he wrote a book called The Principle of Human Moral Nature. And he was actually put in jail for this. And how many people know Voltaire? Okay, Voltaire actually went to jail and posted the equivalent of $90,000 American to get him out of jail because his views, they were so revolutionary, they locked him up for it. But he says in his principles of moral nature, he coins the term human molecule. He said, we conclude there exists a principle in the human body which comes from a great process in which so many millions of atoms of the earth become so many millions of human molecules. So he says there's a great principle in which the solar system formed 4.5 billion years ago. And there's a great principle from which we go from the solar system to people, to us standing up in the lecture room, uh, stepping to the center and lifting up our pencil in the earth. And Euclid, to give you, Euclid was where Goethe that first got his models from before he started formulating turn to these moral symbols. Euclid wrote a book called The Ethics. And Goethe read this one before he was 24 and greatly influenced him. Because what Euclid wanted to do, he says, or Spinoza says, he says, I shall, in 1676, I shall consider human actions and desires in exactly the same manner as though I was concerned with lines, planes, and solids. So he wanted to construct ethics based on Euclidean geometry. And this is where, this is, Goethe read this, and to quote, he says, after seeking through the world in vain to find a means of cultivation for my usual nature, I, I, last fell, I last fell upon the ethics of this philosopher. It would be impossible for me to render an account of how much I drew from my perusal of the work itself and how much I myself read into it. Enough that I found it a sedative for my passions, and then, it, and then it seemed to me to open out 
for me, a free and boundless view of both the sensible and the moral world. And then he concludes, what especially riveted to me, to him, was his utter disinterestedness, which flowed from his every sentence. So this is, this, this, and myself is found pretty much the same theory. Here we go to Humphrey David. This is where you're, this is a simple, one of the first, he thought of people as a point atom, but it, was, it wasn't a simple point atom moving around. You can see the idea that a point atom was based on what's called the, the, uh, the Roger Boschevich, he's, one fam he's a famous polymath. He had the idea that points of atoms are centers of forces. And so this is your distance from the particle. This is what you'll call your the, uh, variation of force potential. So this is a, a Nietzsche built his theory on this, Nietzsche. So here's Leon Rawls, she's the founder of the Lucian School of Engineering from them. She says, we, we, we thought of people as economic molecules and gave concepts like scarcity similar to definitions of heat. We found the Lucian School of Economics. So here's the, if you're going to do any kind of economic engineering modeling, this is the big story here. A lot of this stuff isn't trained, I'm sure it's not translated into Romanian. This is, none of this is translated in English. All these translations I can do myself. And so this is the big school right here. If you want to, where it started specifically was Leon Walrus was walking with his father, Auguste Walrus. They're both a French economist. And on the walk, his father told his son to create a scientific theory of economics. One needs to use differential calculus to derive the science of economic forces, analogous to the science of the astronomical forces. So this one simple idea branched off and formed this whole school of physical economics. And here is Manuel Sala talked about thermodynamic economic temperature. Maybe people have seen that before, that's a very difficult concept. Leon Muniarski talked, he modeled, he talked about morality, law, aesthetics, which in your slide you said aesthetics can't be modeled by science, but when he actually says you can use, this is the second law of thermodynamics, and it measures, but it's what quantitatively measures your versatility in the second law, or in economic systems. He says you can't model these things based on thermodynamics. And just like uh, uh, when I ran to it, when I, we talked yesterday, we talked about irreversibility. This is where the original so here's Irving Fisher is the, one of Jordy's favorites. Uh, Irving, he, he wrote he did some of the first mathematical works in economics. He was the, one of the only PhD students of Willard Gibbs. He says in his PhD dissertation, we treat an individual as a particle and we can formulate which is a work as disutility, energy as utility. So this is one of your first models. Pareto actually read this PhD dissertation when he did his work and he made his own table. He did mechanical phenomena, social phenomena over here. And when I read these tables in 2011, ever since 2011, when anyone sends me a new journal article to the Journal of Thermodynamics, I make my force authors to make these tables to specifically say what their belief system is. How do you define a person? How do you define energy, work, and force? And, what, how do you, and they, they, they give me these tables, and we learn a lot from these. Now here's a nice, this is, uh, this is Prado's spinning social organism model. He thought of people as material molecules, and he's, he, he's known for Pareto principle, which wealth is, is distributed throughout society, such that only 20% 20, 20 of society is where the money is found. 80% don't have money. And he said the reason for this is some, some molecules are gray right here. This is actually his diagram. I added on a few labels to it, but it's pretty top model. It's him it's his from 1902. He says these are less agitated model, molecules. So this is an example of someone who sits around all day and watches TV, a less agitated molecule. Someone who is more agitated they enrich themselves. And this is a process that happens over generations, such that right now Bill Gates is one of the richest people in the world, but Bill Gates, the Gates family won't only last for 300 years. There's a cycle of flow of money. Now this is Mark's model here. Romania, I know, is, uh, fell from this, uh, so, uh, uh, communism and became so socialism. And so Mark's model, Marx also, Marx also talked about people as, as molecules, but he called from the wrong theory. So this is what happens if you call from the wrong theory. Marx had the idea that you can make everyone have a society with equal workers. And so that got adopted by Lenin, and then we have socialism, which is, came to fall, started to come to fall because the molecule didn't hold up because people were starving in Russia. But 
He says the social economic system is like this, all equal. But Fredo says it's like this, there's a pyramid. And one thing that, one study that, uh, did you ever meet Prigozhin? You, you did all your work on Prigozhin, right? Okay, so I haven't read completely your work, but Bill Prigozhin, if people don't know, he's won the first, he won the Nobel Prize for, for non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which he said could apply to, apply to sociology. And Prigozhin, all through his books, and up until his last day, he kept talking about this lazy ant study. And this is a study that's been done in France since the 1980s, where there's a group that takes ants, and they put the nest on one uh, part of a platform, and they put bridges going across the nest, whether it's food or to materials for the society. And some of ants are, they're agitated ants, they work more, they'll go to the other thing to get food for the nest, and some are the lazy ants. And what the French sociologists did, maybe they're anthropologists, but the, they, took, they separated the lazy ants from the hardworking ants. So in a sense, they cut this group off here, and they put the lazy ants into one entirely new nest, and they put the hardworking ants into it, and they, what they did was they studied the lazy ants. So there could be two, this is an example of doing an experiment. What they found, they put, took all these lazy ants and put them into this equal system. But what they found was that even when you took all the lazy ants into the system, some of them began to transform into hardworking ants, and soon enough the system moved back into this shape. So this is an example of you're combining physics, chemistry, with actual models from the, the animal world, the insect world. Here's Prado's. Here's, you can go online. If you want to read more of this, just go online and uh, type in Prado's table and you'll be able to read the whole thing on the website. Maybe. So, Walden Fairburn here. He's, but before I wrote the first, there's, there's actually a two volume book here. Anyways, the first, this is the first book on human chemistry. Before that, it was William Fairburn, who's American chemistry, a real, very simple book. And he talked about people as, as, you could think of people as elements. And that he was, the idea that the person who runs the factory, he ran the dying ma match factory, he was an executive. He said you could talk about people as having electricity, energy, forces, temperature. You could model things like passion in terms of entropy. So I read his book, and that's, you can read that, some of that here in volume one. Here's an example where I ask everybody if you're alive right now. Everybody said I'm alive. Now, Gilbert Lewis, in the uh, 1889, they figured out a way to crystallize the tobacco and mosaic virus. So at this point, more people used to believe that the lowest form of life was the cell. But now we're getting to the point where you can look and crystallize viruses. And this is the borderline between the living and the non-living. So Gilbert Lewis, the person trained under, he's the person who took the work of kids and simplified it. He says he's confused whether to him writing on this book called Anatomy, he gave this lecture called Anatomy of Science. He says the writing, he's confused whether the writing of the book was a chemical reaction or conversely, this is, that would be the extrapolate up method. Or if you do the extrapolate down method, which means you take concepts such as thinking and alive and you extrapolate them down to the virus, you're going to run into with moral, morally confusing questions. So does, is, does the virus think and is the virus alive? And when Gilbert, in 1925, he was confused on this. So here's Victoria Major Anna. He, he got his PhD on radioactivity. He thought that because the uranium is radio radioactive, radioactive, it's unpredictable. You can't measure what it picks on a Geiger counter. That you could take this would this would give a model for social theory. You used to develop one of the first quantum mechanical models. So here's Prado's. Prado used the term. Uh, this is the original economic agent model in terms of Prado. He said a person is a homo economicus, which is modeled on Carl Linnaeus is. An interesting note, by the way, Carl Linnaeus, everyone knows from the uh, biological classification, the Five Kingdom classification scheme. Carl Linnaeus was the PhD advisor for Bergman, who made this big table, which is pretty cool. So, so Fredo took the, uh, he thought of people as like homo, uh, material molecules that vibrate and are acted on by the forces of opulimity. Opulimity is like utility, but he said utility wasn't defined well enough, so he defined this force, this economic force is, is opulimity. You want to maximize this opulimity. So here's uh, Java Newman. He had the floating lot link. He had the automaton theory, the, the chemical, electrical, uh, 
example I told you, where you have the parts floating on the lake, he's got these parts get self-assembly, and that you can apply the, all principles of science to this. And this model is actually funded by NASA for 13 point, uh, $13 billion NASA spent on this theory. So this is an example of cotton engineering, uh, where you would, the idea was that you could set, you could launch some of these Mars, like a capsule, these self-assembly automaton things, and the, you could send the rocket, and it would land on the ground and self-assemble and assemble it with your space station. So here's Progosian. Progosian is the most famous for everyone. Every Progosian wanted to reconcile philosophy with hard science. He had this bifurcation theory. We can't go into that now. So here's Eli Mantra. He's the one I told you about when we all stood up for the experiment. And we, he says that an economic system is comprised of families and or individuals, and somebody in the family has to be working. So if you can quantify that work, it tells that the simplest definition is the Gustav Coriolis principle of the transmission of work. So we lifted the pencil, we did work. That's, those are the kind of doorways into the physics modeling. So he did, Montreal did the first work on spin models. Here's Korea in 2011, getting ready to reinvade North uh, South Korea. And here's just this disoriented crowd. There's a lot of this stuff that goes on in kind of physics right now. So here's laser theory. Uh, Herman Hagen thought of heard that. He thought of people as lasers, and that the, the hole enslaves the, the train the component particles, just like uh, everyone, sorry, a lot of people think of society as uh, sheep, or, and there's a shepherd. And Arthur E. Ball, you want to read about him, he's, he did work at, in California, and he taught engineers on how to under people of atoms and develop things like social processors. So for Bach here, to the critical point theory, I think you might talk about it in your talk here, power law, and how you can be bad in sanguine to the pile, and sooner or later it's gonna, it's gonna go on to the critical point that like when society started, the world started reaching a critical point at the start of World War I, but you couldn't, he says you can't predict exactly when that, when Archduke Ferdinand is gonna be shot because of the San Paulo criticality theory. And then, here's, these are some of the newer models we're, we're seeing about in terms of agent models. This is a Brownian motion agent. He says that a person is like a Brownian particle, which for those who don't know is a pollen grain suspended in water. And if you look at them under the microscope, the pollen grains will vibrate around, and it's what's called random behavior. This is called a random walk. And the idea was that Einstein proved that you could model this in terms of the pollen grain being impacted by water molecules. And from this Brownian motion, this is where the theory of the molecules proved. Anyways, you'll find a lot of this. Lutz, uh, Lutz Greer here is one of the big, big theorists who uses the Brownian motion. Some of these you're going to find errors. He says the Brownian particle has the ability to generate fuel. Okay, that's correct. Everybody has, every particle in the universe has the ability to generate fuel. Then he goes in here and says if the field, if it produces a field with self consistently determined motion, that's what's called perpetual motion. He said if it, a particle generates this field, but then a particle, this is called like a feedback loop. And you, you find a lot of this in modern, when you begin to apply physics and chemistry, you find a lot of people want to use these loop mechanisms to conceive of themselves as a perpetual motion density, which means you're in charge of your own movement. Here's the fellows, uh, fellows, oh, oh, oh. Sabotinsky reaction. This is a chemical <coughs> plot. A lot of people will model humans on these. Some people model people on tornadoes or chaotic systems. This was back in the 90s when chaos theory was a big thing. Here's, this is what you're gonna see a lot of people, a lot of stuff right now is kind of physics. They model, it says a closed economic system that money is conserved, and you can use, think of people as gas particles in the box, and you can get Boltzmann distribution for money. This is a good doorway, but again, this uses, doesn't use chemical thermodynamics, it uses statistical mechanics, which is gas particle based computer. So again, people are not gas particles, but they're particles attached to the surface. So you want to get away from these gas particle models and get start using the surface model, the surface. I'll try to finish up here real quick. And so here's where I come into the picture. The first calculation of the molecular formula for a person was done by American biologists Robert Sterner and James Elser. What their work comprises of is they study freshwater ecosystems, small microorganisms. And they wanted to apply the principle of stoichiometry, which is the, that which means that what 
elements of a periodic table window process have to balance what elements go out of the process. And from their work, they calculated the, principle, they calculated the first definition formula for the human. So you want to study this, study this paragraph here. Well, let's all focus on this. He says, this formula combines all the compounds in a human into a single abstract molecule. Organisms are now to be thought of as complex involved chemical substances that interact with each other and the abiotic world in a way that resembles a complex chemical reaction. So this is the modern way of looking at things now. This is what's going on in America. And so whatever you, your sociology, economics, history, anthropology, philosophy, politics, you're going to want to start with this model. And independent of Stern and Rausser, I didn't know about them until 2000. I learned about them in 2008. And when I learned about them, it was one of the reasons why I wrote, why I wrote this book. Because I already done, most of this book is in chapter five of the book you have there. But when I learned about him, when I learned about the other people, I wrote a history on the human molecule. And I also independently calculated 26 elements, which is more accurate than theirs. So I've talked with them, and they use, let, they only use one mass composition table, so if I had spent three months using uh, a number of different sources. This is another one here. This is from the Chinese School of Common Physics. He uses people uh, reactions, he uses combustion theory, and he uses Here's the calculation of the internal energy of the system. He talks about energy actually. His work's interesting to study. So now we go through here. Instead of talking about particles as being uh, vibrating particles like Prado did, now you want to talk about quantum apply quantum mechanics. So here's a picture of a human system. This is your home, and you talk about people as having orbitals, like change in quantum orbitals. Like normally, I don't go outside of Chicago. I go to the maybe the grocery store. I go to the gym. I go to school, I go to different places, I go to work. But when I interacted with uh, Georgie, I found his work online. I did research on him. I found that they were working, you guys over here were working to build a two cultures department that connects physical sciences with sociology and economics. So I emailed Georgie. And that interaction produced a quantum orbital change. Right? Now I've, my orbitals extend outwards to Romania. So instead of talking about vibrating economic knowledge, if you want to start using this is what's called molecular orbital theory, which is based on quantum mechanics. And that's just one way of thinking about quantum mechanics, not just orbital theory. But and here's the uh, life transition. I asked, well, if you thought you were alive. But when you get to the point of non life to life transition, which you're going to have to deal with if you stay with this theory long enough, you're going to have to ask yourself, what point does the periodic table, as the form change begins to increase from hydrogen upwards to the first uh, virus? And you get to the first animate structure, like a, possibly a bacteria or a thing that bends. And you're going to, you have to ask yourself, at what point do we start calling? Because if you go to the chemistry textbook right now, you know, none of these are kind of being alive or dead, for that matter. They're just chemicals and they have certain levels of animate, animation and reactivity. Some are inert, some can react. So Tesla dug into this problem in terms of energy. He says there's no thing in doubt with life. Francis Crick did the whole book too. He said we should abandon the word alive. And here's a quote from me, not only do I believe in the principle of the afterlife, but I also do not believe in the principle of life. And this was, I, this has been a long, this has taken me, it takes about two years to work out your system. So here's Jeff Tuan, he's the first PhD student, which I, he did his PhD on, he discovered my, he was working in Germany, he's a civil engineer, he was trying to figure out how to model fish systems around power plants, because what's called power, power uh, hydro peaking, when the city consumes a lot of energy, the nuclear plant increases in level, and that affects the level of the river. And then when at night, power level goes down the river, it goes down in height. You want to understand how you can model a fish, because the power plants fund money back to, to universities. So the university people have to figure out ways to use this money. You want to do it formulaically, smartly. So any chance upon, you read my book, and then he contacted me, and he ended up doing his PhD dissertation based on thermodynamics of fish models, molecules. And so he started, he grappled with the same thing, and so in 2010, after grappling with the life issue, you can first, he told me this to me, there does not seem to be any evidence that I'm alive. But again, you might think the statement is like being in a straitjacket, but it's a matter of the belief system. It takes them about two years to work through. So here's advanced engineering thermodynamics textbook. This is my definition here. It's in, they, Kaylin uh, found my definition. He cited it, and this is the modern way of thinking about a human. Human is a 26 element heat slash energy slash heat driven atomic dynamic atomic structure. There's the slash here is a little bit of confusion on his part. Heat heats the system, the sunlight heats the system, but we're free energy driven, not heat driven. There's, 
this is an important technical. So just quickly go, I know we're going over a little bit of time here, I apologize, I'll just wrap it up. This is your equation flow chart, if you want to do any formatting. Robert Fortman, we will sign. This is all in the handout here. But I'll follow through this. This is the formulation of irreversibility. Herman Hamels proved that the, the force A, the reaction arrow, between two things reacting, is measured by the change in the free energy per extent of the isothermal isobaric system. This is important. This connects the work of Goethe, the affinities, this chart here, where Goethe measures socio, socio systems based on these affinities. So this connects Goethe's work with modern Gibbs work. Free energy. So this is your micro, this is your macro. And this is your model you want to start with if you want to do real-time modeling. Yep. Uh, Gustav, uh, Dutch physical chemist, Jacobius Van Hoff proved that you can measure this free energy by the equilibrium constant. What that means is if you have a system equilibrium, <coughs> say Russia, say China, America are economic people. There's an equilibrium reaction going on in exchange of products. And the ratio of the reactants, which is the final states to the products, gives you measure this equilibrium constant. He says you can measure the free energy. So then Rosini says, give or lose, simplified all this. He trained Rosini, and Rosini in his lecture says, we can model society based on this equation. He says, this is security. Everybody wants to be secure in your family and in your country, but then you also want to be free. You want to travel. If you don't like people, please check plenty of you everywhere. So there's a compromise between these two things. And this is where, this is the borderland right here. So now we've got all just the frontier. There's about 40 people doing human free energy theory, which these applies to rise all civilizations. Uh, economics and sociology, this one to economics, this one to relationships, Stepanek is, uh, is economics too. So anyways, you go online, just type in human free energy theory, you're going to read through 40 people on the online page. So this is basically, this is me two months ago at University of Illinois. I took, I don't, this is the blowtorch here. I use the ball and ring experiment to show that you can take the ball, put it through the ring, and you take the, the butane torch and heat up the ball, it doesn't go through the ring. Then you take the butane ball and ring experiment, you dip it in the water, the, the, the brass, the copper, the brass sphere contracts just like society contracts, and it goes through the ring. So this is a very simple model. Once you see this, you can understand conceptually what you're talking about when you talk about expansion and contraction of society. And in particular, this end value here, before entropy was called entropy, it was called transformation content. And before you read about entropy increase, it was called the equivalence value of all uncompensated transformations. And this is, this is the difference in the work energy between day one and day two when society expands and contracts. The problem with Kelsey has had is you couldn't calculate this value n exactly. So just as the, the heat, you could use a work of steam engine, James, uh, Robert, James Jewell showed that you can drop a weight from 755 feet that's connected to an open pulley that's connected to a paddle wheel on a, a tub of water. If you, you convert the work into heat by paddle wheel heating up the tub of water by one degree temperature. So there's a trans, transformation. One's called a forward transformation. One's called a reverse transformation. And what Kelsey has proved was that the two transformations don't compensate each other. The social economic expansion, the work that's created does exactly compromise the work that the socioeconomic contraction creates. And the difference between that is the entropy increase, or the equivalence value of all compensated transformations. And that, that's, this is what gives the arrow time. So again, here's Gibbs, this is Gibbs Henderson, modern, this is modern modern. Here's your, your equilibrium constant. So you have two sy four systems right <coughs> You calculate these concentrations of these. Say this is country, this is another country, and there's migrations of people between two countries. It'll start, say, in year one, and then year 75, you have different concentrations. You can calculate these two things, you get the coefficients, and you can calculate these. And Jay said it's real, real world. So here's an example. Jordy said he likes this graph. This is the, this is mint.com stats of America China food system. Here's America, it has 338 billion dollars worth of export to China. China, 
this is one. So basically, the US exports are 1.4 trillion, and China exports are 1.2 trillion. So there's exchange of economic goods, but the systems are coupled to each other. And the way you understand this burden dynamically is if you have two systems coupling, you have a change in free energy for one system, you have a change in free energy for another system. And if one rule is that for any given system, the free energy has to be less than zero. So if you just have delta G1, you don't have a delta G2, the socioeconomic system will progress, which means you can predict it will go. And the model will work if you can if the, the change in free energy is negative. But what was discovered, what's called coupling theory, which was discovered by Chris Littman, which you want to know all price for, is they they couldn't figure out in the 40, 30s and 40s how they couldn't figure out the physical model of how frog legs twist. There was they had most of the biochemical mechanisms worked out, but they were missing something. So what uh, uh, what they did was they took Gilbert Lewis's thermodynamics and Lewis Fritzman did this, and he showed that the energy that's released that's stored in an ATP bond. Yeah, ATP is the thing that we eat food, carbohydrates, and that stores ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And there's three phosphate bonds there, and each of those bonds has stored energy. What Lipman showed is that if you take Lewis thermodynamics, which is all this up here, the, every time a bond is cleaved, it releases energy. So you have three cleavages. So it's three storages of energy, and all that storage is dry as our internal bodily uh, processes, like whatever, whatever. And so the same as the coupling theory, the ATP would be, if you have two systems, as long as the systems are coupled together, as long as the free energy change for the whole system, in other words, free energy change one plus two is less than zero, and you have conditions for economic advance. You can calculate all this. This is the condition for economic equilibrium. Say, for example, when uh, the fall of Russia in your, in your socialism in class, you can say at that point was an economic equilibrium because their economic model wasn't working anymore. It wasn't. So this is your criteria. <clears throat> this is, we're almost done here, but this is, when you do these formulas here, if you want to talk about entropy, you have to be able to go out in, in society and quantitatively measure these things. You can't just talk about it and let's talk about utility, or just guess and say, oh, utility is entropy, and production is gross natural product is entropy. This is just a little thing picking and choosing. But when you, when you put the sociologists found by taking time-lapse video cameras, mounting them above people walking on the sidewalk, sidewalk, that tall people, beautiful people, and two people together, if people are walking through down the sidewalk, say if a person is sick, is, uh, uh, one person is, two people are passing each other, normal people will be given 25 inches of space. But if you pass by a beautiful person, which is aesthetics, again, beauty work is a metaphysical term, you have to rework that in terms of physical science terms, but when you walk by a beautiful person, you'll give the person more, unconsciously give the person more space. And that's a volume expansion. And that goes into this, this measure of pressure volume work, which goes into the entropy, which was being said as a measure of security. And the pressure, when I talk about a beautiful person being given more personal space, you have to reconceptualize your thinking about uh, personal space. Because the vacuum is very, Back, you know, what's called nature of the vacuum is the most powerful, long going, most theory producing scientific principle ever in, ever in science. And it was before atomic theory came in, it was uh, before, before Democritus, it was, uh, I can't think of his name right now, but he says nature of the vacuum. You cannot make a vacuum in nature. And so scientists spent 3,000 years trying to figure if this is true or not. And Aristotle says, Aristotle said, you couldn't, you couldn't nature of the vacuum. So Otto von Durer, he wanted to disprove this principle. So here's an example of two men holding on a beer cake with a suction pump here, trying to make a vacuum. He, he made a partial vacuum, but he had a ceiling problem. It was air leaking. So here's a partial vacuum where you have a mechanical pump. This is where the ga ideal gas law comes from. This is called the oil pneumatic engine. If you crank the arm here, you can suck the air out of the ball, and then you have a vacuum, a partial vacuum. Then you can, a little boy over here, heat it up, Otto von Bürich was, was the mayor of Nyper in Germany. He did all these experiments for 20 years. The little boy over here, there's a crowd of 400 people over here. The little boy goes over to the piston and the cylinder. These are 20 men holding on to the rope. And if you take the cylinder and you put it up to the vacuum and you crank the arm, the air in the piston and the cylinder is sucked down the vacuum 
And the vacuum is very powerful. It's, it has the weight, it has the power of, when you talk about economic power, you want to be able to conceptualize it in terms of these experiments. Because this is where this is where a conceptual understanding is. So the power in the vacuum has not the power of 20 men. Pull, they're all turned forward when you turn the uh, not here. So when you understand this vacuum is in terms of social power, then you can go from these working models to these equation models. So here's the, you want to get away from these, this is, the old models of thought of people as closed economic systems. Like we, but now we want to get up in terms of, this is semi-permeable open systems. This is from, uh, I can't think of his name right now, but if you write a whole uh, socioeconomic, anyways, so you think people, this is a socioeconomic model. You have n human molecules inside your system, you're bound here, you have that, which is a metaphysical term, you have to use the term analysis instead, which means chemically means taking part. And in terms of birth, you want to use the term synthesis. Because you can because you want to talk about a person, you think of a person as a molecule, instead of talking about life, death, afterlife, you have to use chemical terms to reconceptualize your understanding. So your synthesis is a synthesis of a human molecule, which means the universe forms you, you come into the system. And that comes from that comes from reactions within the system. Then you have out migrations right here. You want to model this in terms of chemical potential. This comes from Gibbs. This is the mass of the person times the chemical potential. This means that when a new, a new person goes into an economic system, they change the chemical potential of the system. They increase the ability of the system to progress. And the same was with the, uh, in, there's the migrations and there's out migrations. And then here's, here's migration in, here's migration out. So when you talk about boundaries, you have this is an example of socioeconomic boundary. Just like I talked about, all thermodynamics comes from this. It's a very simple model. You have your, this is your, the clear part here is the same as the Great Wall of China, but it's not completely closed. Closed means that matter doesn't cross the boundary, only energy or work. So when you have an open system, it means particles go across the boundary. So the person in the old days when China was trying to protect itself, certain people could trans go across the boundary, but there was a cost and there was, it was regu regulated. And this is, these are some of the first experiments done here to actually quantify this in terms of open thermodynamic models. These are piston and cylinders, these are gas molecules. This is semi-permeable membrane in this work list. It's called the Van Hoff equilibrium box. And this is a way you can conceptually understand people going across socioeconomic boundaries. And again, you want to get away from the gas molecules. If you read the, uh, people are not gas molecules, we're, we're semi-detached molecules. Like today, or let, yesterday, I flew here from, from America. So I think of myself as a, kind of like a gas molecule, but we're uh, air, surface, uh, liquid state of existence. So what we want to do here, we're looking to reduce all of the humanities. Some people don't like the term reduction, but it's just a matter of understanding what's going on here. You want to be able to explain your economics in terms of physics and chemistry. Because underlying all the, everything you see around here is atoms moving around by forces. So you want to conceptually understand that in terms of chemistry and physics. And then when you do that, you'll have a better understanding of your, your own existence. You'll feel better about yourself. You'll understand better why you're, why you're moving around and why, what, what you're, why things happen when you do. So here's an example of, if you wanted to, you could, this would be an example of an experiment. If you were talking about when you control experiments, <clears throat> this is called the Schultzman, the Amoeba effect. Aristotle was the one who first discovered this. If you take, I'll just ask, I'll just pull everybody. Say I take uh, water and I heat it up to, say, 30, to a, well, real warm. But then I take another water that's near, near the freezing point and I take these two jugs of water and I put them in the freezer. Who's, with the intuition would tell you that the polar one would freeze faster. But experiment shows that the hotter water freezes faster. So this is puzzling. This is puzzling to them. And this African student was actually from Europe. He was the one that first actually wrote a paper on this. And so that's why this thing is named after him. So the idea here is that the hot molecules are moving around more chaotically. And because their their bonds are more, if you think of a hot system, it's like a socioeconomic system that's heated up. It's not exactly, it's uh, more aggressive. 
maybe kind of like a rainy this morning. But it will cool faster than the new social electronic order because the bonds are already loosened, so it will freeze faster. But when you put cold water in the, in the freezer, when you think of a social economic system that's more uh, reserved, it takes quick, if you want to make a change into the new social economic order, you have to break the old bonds. So the cold water is more frozen in structure. It's difficult to freeze faster. It takes longer to freeze. So the application here, we know that the Cold War took 44 years. It took longer for America and Russia to go into the new social economic order. On the other hand, these hot wars here took only four years. And so the idea here, well, this might might be called what's Machiavellian thinking. But again, when you talk, when you look at these models, you want to think about it in terms of when you think about the moral aspects of what we're saying here, again, you want to talk about the moral symbols of physical physical chemistry. So, cold first war was only four years. The idea is that the, the systems were hotter, and they, they cooled, they froze quicker into the new order faster. So this is one way of. So here's the conclusion. Now, don't be a toolist. Don't use quick tools. Don't just go up your physics book and pick out a random equation because you're going to make people are going to make jokes about you. There's a certain structure to science. You have to figure out what the structure is. But one first is the first and second law are the basis of the structure, and then you go from there. Second, a human is not a gas molecule. A lot of people are doing gas molecule theories right now. And there's all the main schools in America right now. There's three main socioeconomic schools. One's in Houston, one's at uh, Boston, and one's at the University of Virginia. Okay? At least one of the one guy in the uh, Joseph uh, Macaulay, I've talked to him a lot in Houston. He was actually teaches PhD teachers, PhD students, but he doesn't believe thermodynamics can be applied to financial systems. Okay? So his theory is, is not based in reality. But so you want to get away from use, using gas molecule models. You want, what you want to do is consider yourself as a 26 atom molecule. By mass composition, everyone is made of 26 atoms. You think of yourself as a molecule. You also have to think of yourself as a surface attached molecule. Because there's certain, if you read through volume one, you don't understand what exactly that means. How do you, how do you model a person versus a book versus a computer versus uh, information on the internet versus food or water? There's, you have to look at that chemical. There's models for that. So then Goethe was the one who wanted to read a lot, of, spend a lot of time reading on Goethe. You're going to want to go to the online side. So Rosini, to conclude, he says, freedom is governed by entropy change, security is governed by enthalpy change, and it's socioeconomics, although it was started in France 200 years ago, everything I'm telling you here is very cutting edge and will not be for another two or three hundred years before we actually get working economy engineers that actually get these model goals. There's a lot of things to be worked out. And one of the reasons for that is all this is based on work of Willard Gibbs. And Willard Gibbs wrote, wrote this in terms of 700 equations, which are, have been called by people from Einstein to John Strutt to solve the blue sky problems, the densest uh, scientific treatise in all the science. So underneath all this very dense treatise, but you can, like Freud did, Freud didn't use any equations. He just used some of the basic principles, and he, he used his model to to build a psychoanalysis like we have now. It's very, a lot of people are practicing, it's very, so there's an example where you can take theory, put it in practice, you don't exactly have to use the equations. Myself, what I'm working right now is I'm trying to go through all the work of kids, and actually I'm working on, my main goal is to write a textbook called Chemical Thermodynamics with Applications in the Humanities, and have this be, become the new teaching model in America. So that's why I'm working on it. So some of us, you can work with equations, and you can also just use verbal principles here. So that's the end there. Thank you.